Hello and welcome to Module 8, where we're going to step away from the study of bacteria in order to consider Chapter 13, entitled Viruses, Viroids, and Prions. In this module, we'll spend the bulk of our time considering the various aspects of viruses. We'll review a few things from Chapter 8 as well, and then I'll refer you to some self-study at the end of the chapter as it pertains to viroids and prions. In this chapter, our focus will be on non-living infectious particles. And by taking that focus, we're going to look specifically at viruses, their characteristics, their structure, as well as two different life cycles, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. We had an introduction to these terms when we looked at horizontal gene transfer, as we covered generalized and specialized transduction a couple of modules ago. We'll consider bacterial viruses, looking at bacterial defenses against the bacteriophage virus. Then we'll look at the process of animal virus infection and we'll compare the similarities and differences between those two when we look at viral infection with bacteria as compared to animals. And finally, I've included a small number of slides associated with the virus and prions, those non-living infectious particles, but I won't be covering these in lecture. I'll leave you to cover section 13.11 of the textbook on your own, reading the page of materials on these two infectious particles. As we progress through chapter 13, I want you to keep in mind the following. Viruses are infectious particles consisting of little more than genes packaged in a protein coat. They're not cells. They don't consist of cells. We say they're acellular, and really, they only have come to be understood in the 20th century, even though scientists were very suspicious of something much earlier than that. Let's consider the definition of a virus. With my in-person class during the school year, we talk about a virus as being small, non-cellular, or acellular, an infectious agent or an infectious particle, having one or more pieces of nucleic acid surrounded by a protein coat. The nucleic acid making up the viral genome could be DNA, it could be RNA, it might be double-stranded, single-stranded. Lastly, our definition, we usually add that viruses cannot reproduce on their own. In fact, they require a host for any form of replication. And so with this, we might ask ourselves, are viruses living or non-living? Up front, I'll say that there's no universally agreed upon stance on this. It ultimately depends on who you ask and what field of science they study. In class, we tend to make a list of characteristics that define the term living. Without thinking about what we know of viruses, we might simply say living things must respond to their environment or adapt to their surroundings. Living things take up nutrients, excrete wastes. They undergo reproduction, they repair themselves, they need energy to undergo or to participate in their day-to-day -day activities. Honestly, I enjoy seeing where this conversation goes with my in-person class. And because of this asynchronous environment, it's hard to have that kind of conversation here. With a bit of classroom conversation and some debate, we tend to take a long list of things and narrow them down. And so we tend to have four key features. And so write these down. An organism does need to be able to reproduce. An organism must be able to make energy for itself through the process of metabolism, taking catabolism and anabolism and combining those together to encompass metabolism. An organism must be able to respond to some internal or external stimuli, and an organism must be able to maintain homeostasis. Really, there's no right or wrong way in listing criteria that defines living. For humans to be able to live, we must have a heartbeat, we need brain activity, but what about a bacterium? We can imagine vegetative bacteria going about their normal activities, but what about a bacteria able to produce an endospore to live out some kind of harsh environment until conditions get better? I think you might agree with me that to define the term living, it's a bit of a challenge. So here's what I will say about viruses. They're remarkably diverse. They have genetic material. Once delivered to the appropriate environment, some kind of a host, they can replicate. And while they don't have ribosomes to make proteins of their own, they utilize their host cell machinery to make proteins required to rebuild new parts of themselves that idea of reproduction. They don't require ATP the way other organisms do in order to maintain day-to-day -day activities. But why should they when they rely on their host for all that? They can respond to environmental stimuli. They evolve when needed to so as to evade host immune response. Ultimately, I like to think of viruses as extra smart microbes who are somewhat lazy. They rely on their host to do the things for them. Whether or not they're considered living, I'll leave that to you to work out on your own. Now, to provide you with an introduction to viruses, let's go ahead and talk about the major characteristics of viruses. There are nine characteristics. In the past, I've said there are eight. I've added one this summer. Viruses are acellular, meaning they are not cells, do not consist of cells. Further, unlike cellular organisms, and I mentioned this in the last slide, they don't metabolize energy. They neither produce ATP, nor do they perform cell metabolism activities. Viruses are too small to be seen with a light microscope. 
Organisms smaller than bacteria have been known to exist since the late 19th century, but the first visualization of viruses came only after the electron microscope was developed. And so in 1931, a German physicist by the name of Ernst Ruska built the first electron microscope for a PhD thesis. And then eight years later, he and a handful of colleagues were the first to visualize viruses. They saw the tobacco mosaic virus with that electron microscope. And from that point forward, the field of virology progressed quickly. In 1948, differences between viruses that cause smallpox and those that virus that causes chickenpox were compared by electron microscope. The first image of polio virus was taken in 1952. Suffice it to say, the electron microscope aided in the blossoming of the field of virology. But going back to the idea, viruses are small. Viruses can't be cultured outside the host, and we'll see why that is in this lecture. What makes a virus considered non-living is that outside a living cell, they can't grow or reproduce on their own. They lack the metabolic machinery to do so, being totally dependent on their host self for reproduction or replication. This is in contrast to bacteria, which grow in lab on agar plates, or most do, I can't say all do. Viruses are considered obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate means bound to. Intracellular means happens within a cell and parasite, an organism that lives in or on another organism and benefits by deriving nutrients at the other's expense. And although we aren't considering nutrients in the case of viruses, we are saying that the virus acts as a parasite by relying on a host for something. In this case, it's the machinery necessary for replicating oneself. Number five, at a minimum, a virus contains a protein coat surrounding some kind of nucleic acid. Some viruses have an envelope outside of that protein coat, others don't. We'll learn more about that in today's lecture, a few slides from now. Viruses may contain DNA or RNA. The vast majority of viruses possess one of those two, unlike living cells, which possess both. Viruses use host cell machinery to replicate. As I've mentioned already, as an intracellular parasite, viruses lack metabolic enzymes and the equipment needed to make proteins. They don't have ribosomes. And so to get around this, they simply take over the machinery of a host cell that they infect such that they can replicate their own genome and produce the proteins needed to build new virions. Viruses don't divide, number eight. They manufacture new virions, sure, but they do not divide in any manner as we see in bacteria by binary fission, or as human hosts, either by mitosis to grow or by meiosis to um, reproduce. Finally, viruses have a very narrow host range. They recognize and they further go on to infect only a limited number of cell types within a given host species. Such host cell specificity comes about by the evolution of viral recognition systems. And what I mean by that is viruses tend to recognize a specific cell receptor or a surface receptor on the surface of certain cells of a host. For instance, respiratory viruses recognize and go on to infect the respiratory system of their host because they recognize certain host cell receptors in the respiratory system. Viruses that cause digestive system troubles that infect the digestive system recognize certain receptors on certain cells in the digestive tract, attaching there to penetrate without recognizing other cell surface receptors. All this to say, viruses have quite a bit of specificity. Now let's look at this image. I want to impress upon you by looking at this, the size of viruses. And no, I'm not going to ask you to recall the specific sizes of the various viruses here. You don't need to know that poliovirus is about 30 nanometers in diameter. You don't need to know adenovirus is about 90 nanometers in diameter. But I want you to have a general idea of viral size. For reference purposes, this is part of a red blood cell here at right. And as you can see, generally, viruses are very small. Look at poliovirus again here as compared to Ebola. And then look at both of these in comparison to the bacterium Escherichia coli or E. coli, which is quite large and even in decent size in comparison to part of this red blood cell here. Now, another takeaway, a brief takeaway, something we'll come back to. The shapes of these viruses here they are representative of different viruses. Shapes vary. We talk about poliovirus as round or caucus shaped. The tobacco mosaic virus is rod shaped. Ebola virus is somewhat candy cane shaped, really. Um, it, it truly is a helical shape, but it, it then takes some extra shaping. Rabies is rod shaped. We have an outer envelope. Some may describe it as bullet shaped. The rhinovirus is an icosahedral shaped virus. Again, I just want to emphasize, I'm not asking you to know these sizes or these shapes, but I want to impress upon you the variation we find amongst viruses. And this is one way by which viruses can be categorized is by shape. 
Now let's look at viral structure, the general structure of a virus. There are two components or two parts to a virus. We have a nucleic acid core and we have a protein capsid. That outer portion here is a capsid in blue or this kind of teal color. As I've already mentioned, the nucleic acid core can be composed of DNA or RNA. It can be single-stranded. It can be double-stranded. We even see double-stranded RNA, which should surprise you a little bit. Nucleic acid may further be seen linearly or in a circular structure. So we see nucleic acid and a protein capsid. That's the simplest viral structure we have. As it pertains to the structure surrounding and protecting the viral genome, we call this a capsid. It's a protein capsid. The capsid is composed of one or more different types of protein subunits repeated over and over again to create the capsid in the same way that many bricks fit together to form a wall. And this repeating structure is called the capsimere. Multiple capsimeres form this very strong but flexible capsid. And combined with its small size, the capsid is physically very difficult to break open and sufficiently protects the nucleic acid found inside. Together, that nucleic acid and the capsid form what we call a nucleocapsid. Beyond the traditional nucleic acid genome and the capsid, the nucleocapsid structure, viruses may be labeled as non-enveloped, we might call them naked or enveloped. When they're naked, or that non-enveloped state, there's the simple nucleocapsid structure we discussed just a moment ago in the last slide. Quite virulent and pathogenic. Other viruses, though, have an additional superficial structure called an envelope that surrounds the capsid. And the envelope is a lipid membrane that's derived from the cell membrane, typically the cell membrane of a host. Although the envelope can certainly come from other parts of a host cell, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus, or even a nuclear membrane. The envelope is generally acquired during viral release, a process we call budding exocytosis. Keep this in mind, envelope viruses have similar composition to host cells, generally animal host cells. And we see this can be very important in invading the host cell immune system. And I also want to note here, I didn't include it listed out, but both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses possess what are called virus attachment proteins found projecting from a capsid and naked viruses or from the envelope and envelope viruses. And these proteins in a manner of different shapes we might find them in will help facilitate the attachment or adsorption of the virus to whatever the host cell is, which is the first step in gaining entry into a host cell. Viruses possess, as I mentioned, a protein capsid surrounding nucleic acid, protecting that nucleic acid genome from harsh external environmental conditions. With this in mind, our textbook discusses three types of viruses based on shape, so we can categorize viruses based on shape. We have helical viruses, we have icosahedral viruses, and we have complex viruses. And so we see each of those here. Helical viruses are spiral-shaped, curving cylindrically around a given axis. They may be enveloped or naked, and in this case, right here, most plant viruses are naked, whereas helical animal viruses tend to be enveloped. Well-known helical viruses include the influenza virus, measles virus, mumps virus, the rabies virus, and Ebola. We also have the icosahedral viruses. They're by far more prevalent than the helical virus structure. In comparison to that helical structure where the capsid proteins wind around the nucleic acid, the nucleic acid genomes of icosahedral viruses are packed completely within an icosahedral capsid, which acts as a neat little protein shell. And they have 20 faces, each composed of an equilateral triangle. I like to imagine somewhat of a soccer shape. The icosahedron, again, has 20 faces, each composed of that equilateral triangle. Many viruses that infect animals are icosahedral, including human papillomavirus, rhinovirus, herpes viruses, hepatitis B virus. And like their helical counterparts, icosahedral viruses can be naked, they can be enveloped. Lastly, we have complex viruses. While the majority of viruses are categorized as either having helical or icosahedral structure, a few viruses have complex architecture that doesn't strictly conform to this simple helical or icosahedral shape. The bacterial virus, called the bacteriophage, is an example of a virus with a complex structure, and so we see that here. It has an icosahedral head, which contains the nucleic acid. It's attached to a cylindrical tail sheath, and then we see some tail fibers, and that's going to facilitate the binding of bacteriophage to a bacterial host cell. Viruses can be classified in a variety of ways. Here in lecture, up through now, we could say we found four ways to classify viruses. 
we can classify them by the type of genetic material they have. We could see DNA or RNA, it could be double-stranded, it could be single-stranded. We can also classify them by the shape of their capsid, helical, icosahedral, or complex. We could also classify them by their presence or absence of an envelope. And finally, we can classify them by the type of host they infect. And we've talked about three different hosts, animal hosts, plant hosts, or viruses. Finally, we can classify them by the type of host they infect, animals, plants, or bacteria. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, but a couple of other ways we can classify viruses based on the type of disease they produce, as well as even the target cell that they infect. And I won't include those here, but these four you should know because we've talked about them up through now. In this lecture, we'll spend a good amount of time talking about the bacteriophage, a particular virus able to infect bacteria. Like all viruses, the bacteriophage, or the phage, is an obligate intracellular pathogen, or parasite, and that it must enter a host cell in order to replicate. And the bacteriophage is very choosy as to what bacteria it infects. This is referred to as the host range of the phage, and ultimately, it's very species-specific regarding the host, and usually only infects a single bacterial species, or maybe even a strain within a species. For example, the lambda bacteriophage only infects certain E. coli, whereas the SP01 phage infects only Bacillus subtilis, another bacteria. Bacteriophage have a chromosome encased in a capsid composed of phage encoded proteins. And so here's our capsid with our genetic material found inside. For many phage types, the capsid is attached to a tail structure that is also made from phage encoded proteins. So we see the tail structure, that tail sheath here. Some phage have very elaborate tail structures. Some have very simple structures. Also attached to the tail are what we call tail pins or tail fibers. Well, the pins are here, and then we have the fibers, so we see both of those, which aid in the attachment or that adsorption process when attaching to the bacterial host. All types of bacteriophage must carry out a specific set of reactions in order to make more of themselves. First, the bacteriophage must be able to recognize a bacterium that it can multiply in by binding to the bacterial cell surface. The phage looks for some kind of host cell receptor. Once bound to the host, the phage must then get its genome into the cytoplasm of the host cell. And added to this, the viral genome needs to be protected from bacterial nucleases or maybe endonucleases within the host cell cytoplasm that would otherwise degrade viral genome. I want to point out the rate of phage genome transport. If we are imagining here where we're going to attach and then inject our viral DNA here, the rate by which the genome transports into the host cell can be very, very quick. While it's different from phage to phage, insertion of the viral genome into the bacterial host cell can reach values as high as 3,000 base pairs per second. Think about that for a moment. 3,000 base pairs per second can be injected within the bacterial cell. Now, phage genome must then be replicated as well as gene expression must be coordinated with transcription and translations such that the genome, the capsid proteins, the tail proteins if present are all produced within the right order at the right time. New phage particles are then assembled. We might call this the assembly process or the maturation process and the phage must find its way then out of the bacterium. I want to make mention of two more terms here as it pertains to escaping the confines of its host after it's assembled itself. The number of replicated phage particles that can be released from one bacterium after infection and growth by one infective bacteriophage, that's known as the burst size. How many phage are released from one bacteriophage infection? And that's called the burst size. Every phage has a characteristic burst size. It can be a few hundred phage, it can be 10 phage, it can be many hundred phage. Every phage also takes a different amount of time to go through one growth cycle, which we call the burst time. So we have burst size and burst time. Once a bacteriophage attaches to a susceptible bacterial host, it pursues one of two replication strategies. We covered these concepts very, very briefly when we looked at the process of transduction as a form of horizontal gene transfer in the study of chapter eight. And we'll look at these processes in a bit more detail now. The lytic phase is the process of a bacteriophage, our textbook calls this the virulent phages, that infect a bacterium and produce progeny. That's again, it's called the lytic phase. We're in the, the business of making more phage. Some bacteriophages are also capable of maintaining their chromosome 
in a stable silent state within the host bacterium, by which a phase encoded enzyme called integrase inserts phage DNA into the host cell chromosome. This process of integration or incorporation into host genome is called lysogeny, which produces what's called a lysogenic infection. It's the result of an infection with what's called a temperate phage. A few other terms to mention, when a bacterium contains a silent phage, the bacterium with that phage inserted in DNA is called a lysogen. In contrast, the incorporated phage genome itself is called the prophage, and so I've included that terminology here. Let's examine the five steps of replication in the lytic infection between a bacteriophage and a bacterial host looking specifically at a double-stranded DNA phage called the T4 phage, which infects E. coli. It's a five-step process, and it's also outlined in our textbook. The first step is the attachment phase. We call this process adsorption. None of this is new to you. Phages are non-modal, but through a purely random collision process, they make contact with a bacterium in the environment, whereby attachment is dependent on both chemical attraction as well as the precise fit between attachment proteins on the phage tail fibers as well as a complementary receptor protein on the surface of the host cell wall. The specificity of the attachment proteins for the receptors ensure the virus only attaches E. coli in this case. And I need to mention here, these cell surface receptors on E. coli, they haven't been designed to be recognized by the T4 bacteriophage. They serve some other purpose for the bacterial cell, with the bacteriophage exploiting the receptors for their own use. Next, after attachment, the phage needs to penetrate the bacterial cell wall, getting through layers of peptidoglycan as well as the cell membrane in order to inject the viral genome into the host cell. In this manner, the T4 bacteriophage releases a substance called lysozyme, which weakens and breaks down the peptidoglycan cell wall, such that then the phage tail sheath can contract, forcing an internal hollow tube within the tail through the cell wall and cell membrane, kind of like a hole punch might punch through papers or a hypodermic needle may penetrate the skin. The phage then injects its genome through the tube and into the bacterium. Following penetration, viral enzymes degrade bacterial DNA into short little nucleotide sequences. The empty capsid is left on the outside of the bacterium, not detaching as you might expect. In the third step of the lytic phase, we see the synthesis step. We're making phage proteins. We're replicating phage genome. This is a step simply referred to as synthesis or biosynthesis. After losing its chromosome, the bacterium stops synthesizing its own components, begins synthesizing new viral components under control of the viral genome. It replicates viral genome as well as we see protein synthesis is similar to the process of cell transcription and translation in bacterium that might be performed for its own purposes, except in this case, the mRNA made is transcribed from viral DNA instead of bacterial cell DNA. The translation process using host cell ribosomes results in the production of viral proteins, including those capsomeres, components of the tail fiber. We also see some viral DNA polymerase, which then allows us to replicate viral DNA with the next infection. We do see some more production of lysozyme, which is going to then allow all of these bacteriophage to lyse open the bacterial cell after the virion assembly is complete. This biosynthesis or synthesis process is carefully controlled to ensure all components are ready to be assembled at the same time. The assembly process of new bacteriophage isn't well understood, but in this maturation phase, the capsomeres form new capsid heads that surround viral genome, the tails assemble attached to the heads, the tail fibers attach to the tails, forming mature virions. This assembly process appears to occur spontaneously, requiring very little enzymatic activity. And it's in this step we saw transduction as a means of horizontal gene transfer in chapter 8. Sometimes a capsid accidentally assembles around leftover pieces of host bacterial DNA rather than viral DNA, leading to a process called generalized transduction. And after release from the original host cell, a new virion formed in this manner is still able to attach to a new bacterial host by means of its tail fibers. But rather than inserting phage DNA, it inserts bacterial DNA from the first bacterial host into a new bacterial host, presto horizontal gene transfer. We'll return to this to review both generalized and specialized transduction later on in lecture. Once new virions have been assembled, they're released from the host cell by a process we call lysis. In this manner, lysozyme completes its work on the cell wall, weakening it in such a way that newly made bacteriophage are released into the environment. That's the process we call lysis. 
As we look at this five-step process, the T4 bacteriophage, that particular bacteriophage has that lytic replication cycle. It takes about 25 minutes for us to go through these various five steps, producing as many as 100 to 200 new virions for each bacterial cell that's been lysed. And as mentioned earlier, the period of time required to complete this process from attachment to release, we call that the burst time. And the number of new virions released from each lysed cell is called the burst size. Not all viruses follow the lytic pattern of infection I just presented with the T4 bacteriophage. Rather, some bacteriophage have a modified replication cycle in which infected host cells grow and reproduce normally for many generations before lysis after being infected. Such a replication cycle is called the lysogenic replication cycle. And the phages that induce them are called temperate phages, or sometimes they're called lysogenic phages. In this slide, I'll introduce you to the lambda phage, another type of bacteriophage that also targets E. coli as we walk through the lysogenic phage of bacterial infection. So in the first step, a virion randomly contacts an E. coli cell and attaches via its tail fiber. This step unfolds just as we saw with the lytic cycle in the T4 bacteriophage, so nothing's different there. Viral DNA enters the cell just as we saw before with the help of lysozyme and that injection by contraction of the tail sheath, which sends a hollow tube through the bacterial cell wall, allowing the genome to enter. Now, what proceeds is different than the lytic cycle, so what happens next is a little different. Rather than destruction of host cell DNA, the viral genome taking over control of the bacterial cell. It doesn't really take things over yet. The virus remains inactive. In fact, a phage-encoded enzyme called integrase inserts the phage DNA into the host cell chromosome. So we see viral genome being introduced into bacterial genome. And this integrated phage DNA is called a prophage. So we insert a prophage into our host cell genome. And the prophase can remain inactive, coding for a protein that suppresses prophage genes such that the bacterial cell goes along its merry way, replicating by binary fission without knowing it's been infected. The viral genome has become a physical part of the bacterial chromosome. And so time goes by, every time the bacterial cell replicates by binary fission, the prophage, which has incorporated itself into the bacterial genome, also replicates. Thus, all daughter cells of the lysogenic cell contain the prophage with that viral DNA within the bacterial chromosome. And the bacteriophage genome replicates can contribute to the pathogenic nature of the infected bacterium. So we could potentially be making a protein that's encoded for by this viral DNA. In fact, bacteriophage genes can be responsible for various toxins and other disease-causing proteins found in bacteria. Now, at some point later on, potentially under some harsh conditions, and harsh condition might be a change in nutrients, space, a temperature change, a pH change, exposure to UV light's a big one, exposure to x-rays, possibly exposure to some kind of carcinogenic chemical, a process called lysogenic conversion unfolds. We call this process of removal or the excision of that prophage, we call that induction. So in the process of induction, we undergo lysogenic conversion. And in this manner, the prophage, again, it's excised from the bacterial host DNA, and we then pick up a lytic cycle. So then the lytic steps of biosynthesis and assembly, that maturation process proceeds, whereby the host cell becomes so filled with virion again that it breaks over and bursts open via lysis with the help of lysozyme, releasing new bacteriophage into the environment. What I'd like to do now is revisit and review the process of generalized transduction that we looked at in chapter 8 when we looked at bacterial genetics and specifically the process which we call horizontal gene transfer, where a lytically driven bacteriophage accidentally packages up a piece of bacterial genome in error, acting as a vehicle for the introduction of original bacterial host genome to new bacterial host genome. We'll walk through the steps and just as before, pay close attention to what it is we're packaging up in bacterial host cell number one and what it is that's being released into bacterial host cell number two. In the process of generalized transduction, we're going to start with a host cell, and we call this host cell number one, and we will see bacteriophage come in and attach to that host cell. Now we do have bacterial genome, and we're going to have viral genome. So what happens is we're going to see the insertion of viral genome into the host cell. At this point, we're going to see the lytic cycle unfold, by which we are going to see breakdown of our bacterial host cell genome 
And we are then going to see the viral genome and that virus we're going to see take over the cell machinery of the host cell. So now we're going to see replication of viral genome. We're going to see all the parts of a bacteriophage made. And then we'll see assembly. And accidentally, we may pick up a little bit of that degraded bacterial genome. And so now we're going to see cell lysis. And I am interested this one right there. So now we're going to see new infection. We're going to see host cell number two bacterium infected by bacteriophage that has a little bit of genome from host cell number one. And here's our host cell number two genome. And so we're going to see that insertion of, and ultimately we're going to see that incorporation of bacterial genome from host cell one into host cell two. And so this is the idea of horizontal gene transfer by way of generalized transduction. Next, I want to revisit and review the process called specialized transduction. This is the second process by which we see horizontal gene transfer unfold by transduction. And in this case, we see the excision of a prophage with just a little bit of bacterial genome on one or both sides of that prophage. So we're picking up a little bit of bacterial genome. Again, this is done by accident. And as we progress through that lytic conversion, we see going from lysogenic to a lytic conversion, the machinery in the bacterial host cell goes on to replicate viral genome, which includes these little bits and pieces of prophage, such that when the new bacteriophage is assembled, it includes the viral genome as well as the little piece or pieces of the original bacterial host cell genome. When the bacteriophage goes on to infect a new bacterial cell, becoming host cell number two, it inserts not only its genome, so the bacteriophage inserts its genome, but also that little bit of bacterial genome into the host cell cytoplasm. In this manner, as was the case of generalized transduction, the bacteriophage acts as a vehicle for the introduction of bacterial genome between one bacterium and another. Now let's go ahead and look at specialized transduction, and we're going to assign green for our bacterial cell genome. And again, we will assign red for our viral genome. We will see the penetration of viral genome by which we see this unfold now. And rather than begin the lytic cycle, we are going to see a lysogenic cycle. We're going to see that integrase with prophage. And so now we're going to see this type of scenario right here. And then we're going to see traditional binary fission by which we're simply making a progeny of this right here. And replication can go on for many, many generations whereby this prophage is seeded within the bacterial chromosome until we get to a harsh condition. And those harsh conditions can be a drop in nutrients, drop in space, change in pH, change in temperature, we can have UV light, we can have x-rays, we can have some kind of chemical. What's going to happen then is the prophage excises. And so that's going to bring us here. And so now once again, we have our bacterial genome and our prophage has excised. However, there's a little mistake that's made. And during that excision process, we also excise a bit of bacterial genome. So mistake in excision. And now we're going to see synthesis of these various parts of the viral genome because now our viral genome has taken over control of the cell. So we will say viral genome takes over cell machinery. And now we're going to replicate. We're going to see all these parts made. We're going to then put the parts together and assemble them. Now what happens is we're going to see cell lysis just as we saw before. Now we're going to get, this is going to be bacterial host cell number two, which will insert itself into, here's going to be our new genome. And 
and gradually we will see the incorporation of that bacterial genome from host cell number one incorporated into the bacterial genome of host cell number two, which we have identified as green. And so that is specialized transduction. And again, this is horizontal gene transfer by which we take genome from host cell one, and that is going to end up as genome in host cell number two. Next, I want to discuss bacterial defense against the bacteriophage and its infection. Be sure you think about the various aspects of infection. Be sure you focus on those five steps. First of all, let's think about preventing phage attachment. A successful bacteriophage infection begins with adsorption of the virus to a specific bacterial surface receptor. Such receptors must not only be present on the surface of the cell, but they must be accessible and well distributed as well. Therefore, strategies to prevent phage adsorption may include modifying the receptor structure through mutation or concealing those receptors, such as by physical barrier, like having a capsule. So those are some ideas to prevent adsorption. Next, if we miss out on the opportunity to prevent attachment, we might still be able to prevent phage genome insertion or release. So bacteria may focus their attention on blocking the bacteriophage genome from being injected into the bacterial cell. Some bacteria have developed injection blocking systems to prevent insertion of viral genome. If a bacteriophage successfully adsorbs and injects its genome into the host cell bacterium, all is not lost. There may be intracellular defenses to prevent infection. Some bacteria rely on endonuclease enzymes to destroy invading DNA by cleaving it into harmless fragments or segments. Other bacteria may be able to target nucleic acid, modifying it in such a way that it can no longer be recognized by host cell DNA replication machinery or potentially gene expression machinery. Enzymes called methyltransferases are a good source of this, adding methyl groups to DNA in order to silence the viral genome, much as our own DNA can be silenced through the process of methylation. Bacteria may also choose to sacrifice themselves rather than become infected, so as to protect a surrounding colony from predation. In this manner, bacterial cells may choose cell lysis before the assembly process of bacteriophage is complete. Now, in closing, I want to point out the various phage resistance mechanisms I've just discussed have mostly been studied in labs individually, but it's thought bacteria employ several different lines of defenses simultaneously in order to overcome infection. And these are just a few of the concepts. We've looked at bacterial viruses in great detail as we studied the bacteriophage. Now, I want to go ahead and look at animal viruses. Animal viruses have the same five basic steps in their replication pathways as the bacteriophage. We have attachment or adsorption. We have the entry or penetration phase. We have biosynthesis. We have that assembly or the maturation process, and then we have release. But despite having the same steps, there are some significant differences we'll discuss here by looking at these two concepts side by side, infection with bacteriophage to bacteria and infection with animal virus to some kind of animal. First, there are a few things to mention with attachment. We learned the bacteriophage relies on tails to attach to receptors on the host cell. In contrast, animal cells often rely on other proteins, including spikes, for attachment. And I'm going to pull up this slide. As it pertains to animal viruses and how they attach, they attach to the host cell depending on whether the virus is enveloped or naked. Enveloped viruses may enter the host cell in one of two different mechanisms that I've showed here. First, they can enter the host cell by fusion with the host cell membrane. And so that's what we're going to see here is this process of fusion. The lipid envelope of the virion fuses with the cell membrane of the host cell via attachment to host cell receptors. And so we're seeing that attachment process here. And we're going to ultimately then see this kind of next step moving into fusion. As a result of fusion, the nucleocapsid is released directly into the host cell membrane. And that works out real convenient. We don't even have to worry about a capsid at this point. In contrast, I'm looking at, at this one here, envelope viruses can also enter the host cell by way of endocytosis. And in this manner, the virus is going to bind to host cell receptors, causing the cell to take virions in. And so we see that next step right here. Upon being taken in, the viral envelope is going to fuse with the endosome. So we create an endosome as we pull this in, and we see that viral envelope fusing with the endosome. That's going to release the nucleocapsid into the cytoplasm. And now, as compared to envelope viruses, naked viruses have no lipid envelope. 
and have no cell membrane by which to fuse. Therefore, viruses must enter by a process called endocytosis, at which time the nucleocapsid is released into the cytoplasm. Next, we can talk about the process of uncoating. In the bacteriophage, there's nothing to uncoat. Viral genome is inserted directly into the bacterial host cell. However, when we consider animal viruses, we see that we need enzymes to target the removal of the capsid, resulting in the release of viral genome into the cell. So just getting the virus into the cell, when we're talking about animal cells, isn't enough. We now need to break down that capsid in order to release the viral genome. In terms of site of synthesis, in the bacteriophage, we saw the site of, the, of biosynthesis or synthesis in the cytoplasm of the cell. There is no other place for things to, to happen because we have no membrane-bound organelles. However, when considering animal viruses, we must first ask whether we're looking at an RNA virus or a DNA virus. The RNA virus tends to undergo synthesis in the cytoplasm, whereas a DNA genome, that DNA genome virus, undergoes synthesis in the nucleus. In turn, we also rely on different sites for the maturation or assembly process. Now, when we talk about release, as we look at the mechanism of release for animal viruses, so I'm going to connect a bit back to synthesis. The mechanisms of release has something to do with whether we're looking at a naked virus or an envelope virus. As we focus on the naked virus, they're released primarily by cell lysis. Potentially, exocytosis might be an option. But envelope viruses, and this is where we connect back to the cytosynthesis, envelope viruses need to pick up their envelope. And so we might say that most of an envelope virus is formed in the nucleus if it's a DNA virus or if it's an RNA virus in the cytoplasm. But the last bit of synthesis is going to happen as we're releasing an envelope virus. It needs to pick up its envelope. And this occurs during the release process in something we call budding. And so as a virus is being released, we see it kind of squeeze on through the cell membrane and it picks up a bit of that cell membrane and wraps it around itself. And that creates that viral envelope. We're now at the last slide I'm going to discuss in today's lecture. There are a couple of slides beyond this with viroids and purions, but you'll be responsible for studying those on your own together with section 13.11. Meanwhile, let's talk about the categories of animal viral infections various categories of these infections, of which we have two major categories we call acute and persistent infections. So animal viruses can cause acute infections and persistent infections. So those are the first two we're going to look at. Acute infections are infections of relatively short duration with a rapid recovery. We might describe them as having a rapid onset, commonly a short but severe course of disease, producing a large amount of virus, and then immune clearance within you know, a week or two. Most viruses that infect humans are acute, such that those that cause routine respiratory infections, cold viruses, flu viruses, those that cause gastrointestinal infections, the rotavirus or norovirus, these are acute infections. In contrast, we have persistent infections. These are infections in which the virus is continually present in the body, not being cleared following that primary infection. In fact, they remain in specific cells of infected individuals. And these infections present a balancing act between the virus and host, whereby symptoms may flare up when our immune system is suppressed. In terms of persistent infections, there are two types. So we have two main types, but then we have two subtypes under persistent infections, and those are chronic and latent. Chronic viral infections may follow a primary infection directly, or they may require months or maybe even years to develop. They're defined by being a result of a virus present in the body at all times. So we have these viruses that are present at all times. The disease may be present or absent for extended periods of time, but in chronic infections, we tend to find that the virus is there. It's persistent, but it's chronic. We have good times and we have bad times. We do tend to find with chronic infections that we have tissue damage, we have alterations of the immune system. So these are serious, and, and I'm certainly not saying that these latent ones aren't going to be serious, but they tend to cause damage. Latent infections, these are persistent infections that can be described as the continued presence of infectious virus following some kind of primary infection, but we lack a demonstrable infectious virus between episodes of recurrent disease. So we, we have something happen 
And then we, right here, this is a good image right here of our, our latent infections. We have our acute primary infection, and then we go a period of time, and then we experience more symptoms, and we might go another period of time, and then we might experience more symptoms. Latent infections require some kind of reactivation to begin replicating again. And I think the best example is the virus varicella zoster, the virus that initially causes chicken pox and then later on in life shows up as shingles. But we could also say a Latin infection includes herpes simplex 1 virus, the virus that causes cold sores. And you might have a cold sore show up around your mouth and then you may be under stressful circumstances and then time goes by and then you have another one. That's an idea of a latent or latent viral infection. And so I think that this graph does a good job of showing that, whereas we have this persistent chronic infection where we're always going to have virion being produced. Our acute or that initial description that really is we have one primary infection, our immune system takes care of it, and then we don't see any future signs or symptoms of additional infection. And so I think this is a good image of these various, these two major components with some subparts here. With that, I'm going to conclude this lecture. I've included a couple of slides on prions and viroids, the topic again of section 13.11 of our textbook, and I'm not going to go into those in lecture, but you can, you may, you possibly will, find questions on your final exam which address these two, prions and viroids. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And meanwhile, make it a great day.